Hi everyone and welcome to another Shock Rebuilding video. My name is Ben and this is Shock Service LLC and shockservice.com. We're going to try a new video format here, so let us know in the comments if you like this, if we should do more of these, or we'll keep changing it up. So today we've got a set of ADS shocks in for service. These are pretty unique. These are off of an Ultra 4 uh, race car, and or buggy I should say. And they've got threaded cylinders for a smoothie shock, which is unusual. That's typically left for coilovers. And it's got a lower welded reservoir port that gives us more control during the compression stroke. Right there, Steve was checking the reservoir pressure followed by a check for air pockets within that shock. So whenever we check in the shock, we kind of write down all the main uh, details of the shock, the travel length, the body size, reservoir configuration, bearing size spacers, just for reference. That way we can always look back to it. And that way the client who's gonna get a copy of that spec sheet will have all the references for it. So now the set screw is removed from the wiper cap and the wiper cap is removed using a spanner wrench. Reservoir pressure was left in the reservoir during that stage. That keeps pressure on the seal head so you can remove the wiper cap. So this is pretty unique to ADS shocks as well as the Race Series King shocks. They use threaded in end caps on the reservoirs. So Steve has to wrap some rubber around them to keep them from spinning and hold them tight. Now this looks pretty crude using a set of pliers to do this. These particular shocks had slightly oversized reservoirs, so it's somewhat of a custom reservoir size, and we did not have the proper wrench for it um, in-house, and so we wanted to get these turned around quickly. And as you can tell, the shocks have had a pretty rough life to begin with, so a few extra scratches on the reservoir end cap aren't gonna be a big deal. Uh, but rest assured that on future service, we do have that wrench now. So with the wiper cap removed and the retaining ring removed, we nice and gently and smoothly remove the shaft and make a huge mess everywhere. Uh, I left this in the video because I just wanted to let everyone know that even the best of us make a big mess servicing shocks. So if it happens, it happens, clean it all up and you move forward. Generally, if you can get a nice smooth pull on that, you can burp a little bit of air underneath that piston and uh, that kind of uh, offsets the vacuum that you're fighting against. But every once in a while, it just frees up unexpectedly and you make a big mess. What Steve is doing here now is he's, he's pushed the internal floating piston in that reservoir all the way to the end. And he's measuring that depth. That gives us the maximum depth of the internal floating piston, which is gonna help us during assembly when we set the, the proper internal floating piston depth. The shaft nut was removed, followed by the rebound shims, piston compression shims, and, uh, and some of these spacers. In just a second here, you will see as Steve holds the top of that shaft with his fingers, he put, keeps his fingers over those threads. And that's because inside the seal head, you have a DU bushing that you don't want to scratch. We knew that these shocks came in with a bent shaft. Uh, if you don't know if a shaft is bent, you roll it on a flat surface. We like to use that water level there because it's got a groove on the top. And if it wobbles, as I'm sure you saw it did, you know that the shaft is bent. It's possible to sometimes fix a shaft, a bent shaft, but uh, we've got replacements in stock, and so we'll just go ahead and replace that. Steve has laid out all of the compression and rebound shims as well as the other uh, piston components uh, and seal head here. And what he's doing is he's marking the thickness of those valving shims so that we can mark down what the valving in that shock is. So um, if you can read this upside down, on the rebound, it looks like we've got a flutter eight stack, and on compression, we've actually got some doubled up shims with a primary eight shim, a flutter eight, followed by some 10s, 12s, and 15s, and looks like there's a 20 in there. This is a step that we don't always take. Uh, if the shocks came in with a standard pyramid stack, we don't really have to measure the diameter of the shims, but in this particular case, since it is a racer and it is a complex shim stack, he's measuring the outside diameter of those valving shims just for our records. You'll notice that he's labeling the bins for top and bottom shims, and it's all about keeping things organized, keeping things clean and organized, and more so than that, taking your time. So we have the new replacement shaft here. Rather than just trusting that it's the correct replacement, we always check for tolerances, diameter, length, uh, stud, all those details, and of course it checked out, as it almost always does. What you're gonna see now is just a lot of cleaning. This is this is something that we take pride in when we service shocks. We have a flat rate fee for, 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 that, for the main service of that shock. And everyone that services shocks for us takes their time. There's no rushing here. 
when you're servicing shocks, especially for a racer that's going to prepare for a major race out of state, lots of money, lots of time. You want to make sure that everything is correct. And we pretty much take this same, I mean, we do, we take this same, we take these same steps for every shock that comes through here, regardless of what it is. Uh, what you see now is Steve trying to remove the main seal from the seal head. And I could have cut that, but I just wanted to show you that sometimes they get stuck. Sometimes they are a pain to remove, especially if you're trying to avoid scratching it. So in the end, he did end up having to use a metal pick. Uh, if you go back and you rewatch that, you can see how he carefully pokes that pick through the seal and then you can pry it up and it gets it out. So pref we prefer not to have to do that, but if the seal is stuck in there, it's, it's one of the things that you just have to do. Here he's cleaning out more of the threads, more of the O-ring valleys. And the, the general concept here is the cleaner everything is, the better you can see what's going on, and it'll eventually help with the assembly. That right there is a Schrader valve cap. It threads into the reservoir end cap and protects the Schrader valve. We're seeing more and more of that. I know that with King, they recently moved over to making that a standard option. It used to be a, a, a specialty option, but now that's gonna be standard. And we like that for two reasons. Number one, does it, it, it protects the Schrader valve, but number two is it's got a redundant seal. So it's gonna have an O-ring on it. And if for some reason the Schrader valve in the, I'm sorry, the valve core in the Schrader valve goes loose, the, the Schrader valve cover will provide a secondary seal. The, uh, what, what you're gonna see here is using an emery stone. So all it takes is a small hair, a very small scratch, a small imperfection on any of these O-ring surfaces and the shock may leak or lose reservoir pressure. So that's why whenever we're working on shocks, we'll use those cosmetic wooden sticks. You can see them in the upper left-hand corner, you would have seen it before. That's how he re removes all of the O-rings and the seals. These emery sticks, emery, not really quite a stone, but it's an emery stick. They are a rubber stick impregnated with an abrasive and they come in different coarseness. So we use a fine, fine thread one for, for most work and polish up all of these areas. Again, it's just any scratch that we can remove will, will make the, the shock more, will make it seal more accurately. Uh, Steve is putting all the parts into an ultrasonic cleaner here. Anything that he couldn't get off with a paper towel or some of the grime that gets stuck into areas that you just can't get, the ultrasonic cleaner is going to clean up. And when you remove them, they tend to look like brand new parts. So we really, um, really like using that. Any of the tools that you see in this video, we, we've got links to them on our parts page. So that's on crawlpedia.com. I'll link to it in the description of this video, but if you go to crawlpedia.com, there's a whole page there for shock servicing tools and parts. So anything that you see in this video, you can find there. I'm not sure if you caught that, but Steve was using a file to polish up the, or file down the burrs that were created when he used pliers on that end cap. A step that absolutely did not need to be taken. Had he not done that, nobody would have ever known, but it just goes to show that when you take pride in what you do, you do things that nobody would ever know, nobody would ever see, unless I mentioned them to you in this video. The cleaning cycle is finished and you'll notice that these parts look amazing. I mean, they really look like brand new parts. So even though the shock is abused and, and, and trashed and thrashed. The nice thing about having large components, large CNC machined, accurate, uh, tight tolerance components is they should pretty much last forever. And part of the idea of taking time and servicing shocks is that the better care you take of them, the more you service them, the more you clean them, the longer they're gonna last. And of course, any component on the shock, if it gets damaged to the point that it can't be repaired or reused, you can always source a new part and, and replace it. So even with that, you're looking at a lifetime of use. And in this case, maybe a lifetime of racing with the same set of shocks. Uh, whenever we're putting a shock back together, we always dip the O-rings and the seals into shock oil. That's all that that is. There's no assembly lube or anything special here. That's just shock oil. Um, we don't want to contaminate the shock oil once everything gets put back together. So just a lot of O-rings, a lot of O-rings. Whenever you get a seal kit, a lot of times it'll include extra O-rings. So you might not use everything that comes in a seal kit. And that's just because of variations with, with the shock configurations. The, you'll see the piston there on the bottom left hand of that paper towel. The piston is side specific. When we get to the assembly process here, you'll notice that 
you'll have to be very careful in the orientation of that piston. In this particular case, it is an asymmetric piston, so it's gonna have six ports on the compression side and three on the rebound side. You'll see that here in just a second. Here, to clean out the inside of the reservoir and the shock body, we use a long pair of surgical prongs, surgical pliers, I'm not sure what to call those. You'll notice that Steve used a flashlight there to check for scarring inside of the reservoir cylinder and the shock body. You're going to see some machining marks. You're going to see some wear marks. Those are no concern, but what we're really watching for is deep scratches and primarily scratches that would run up and down or vertically within that shock uh, cylinder. These bearings were actually in really good shape. We're not going to have to replace them. They had very few miles on them. Uh, even though it was hard miles, they were pretty easy. And what you saw there was Steve using a product called TriFlow, which is a Teflon lubricant, um, just to give the bearings a little bit more life and kind of freshen them up. That product is available on that tools page that I mentioned earlier, uh, available on Crawlpedia. So check out that link and you can find those parts. Steve put the internal floating piston into that reservoir and pushed it all the way to the end. That's done using a threaded rod, almost always a quarter inch coarse thread, threaded rod. You can get that at any hardware store or on that link page on Crawlpedia. He fills the shock body with oil. And since this reservoir port is now at the top of the shock, but when it's assembled, it's at the bottom of the part, he kind of has to fill it like a bypass shock by cycling the oil back and forth using the IFP. So believe it or not, these are used parts. Once they're all cleaned up and run through the ultrasonic cleaner and polished up, they look brand new. So that was a seal head before with the wiper cap attached. This is the piston. Not sure what that cut was, but uh, there was the reservoir end cap. More shock oil used for lubrication. That's just gonna help all these seals, the seal head and components get on that shaft, being very careful not to scratch that DU bushing. Now everything kind of goes back together in the reverse order in which it came apart. We're gonna start with the compression shims, the piston. You'll notice that it's got six ports on top, the rebound shims, spacer and, and the nut. So this is a self-locking nut. Usually we'll still add a drop of Loctite to it just for redundancy. And there you can see the three rebound ports at the bottom. The shaft gets inserted into the shock body. Looks like he had just a little too much oil in there, but uh, no harm done. And we're pushing the shaft in through the oil. And what's happening now is it's filling up the pockets in that piston and moving the oil into that reservoir. If you use a dead blow hammer like this, you can tap to get any trapped air bubbles within that piston past the valving shims. So anytime you're assembling a shock, tapping it with a hammer like that is always a good idea. Now, all he's doing is pushing it back and forth, back and forth. Again, this is a little bit trickier when that reservoir hose feeds at the very top of the shock like this. I'm not sure if I mentioned it before, but that's done on high performance shocks because it gives you more control over the compression stroke. On a lot of other shocks, on most shocks rather, the reservoir comes out from what would be the top of that shock. So this is where he's measuring the depth of that internal floating piston. And that needs to be set to a specific position. We wanna have enough volume for the nitrogen, but we wanna have a little extra oil in that reservoir as well. It's gonna help with, well, reservoirs don't really do a lot for cooling, but for racing application, the more you have, the better. So now he's going to thread in that reservoir end cap. And this is where making sure that all of the threads were nice and clean without any imperfections really helps a lot because you definitely don't wanna fight this. And he's just going to make that snug. So once that is seated, he is going to put the valve core back in the trader valve. Uh, again, that just needs to be snug. We don't wanna over tighten that. It is, a, it is a very small part. After that, he's going to put pressure into the reservoir we start with about 50 PSI to seat the shaft and we'll later put about 350 in there for it to sit at pressure test. The 50 PSI should be enough to tighten the wiper cap and it was. And you'll notice that he has not tightened the set screw yet. We'll save that for after they pass pressure test. Right now, we will lay them on absorbent paper to check for leaks. And if the shocks pass pressure test, they get boxed up, shipped back to the customer and ready to race. So hope you enjoyed that video. Let us know if you like that format, like and subscribe and as always, Thanks for watching.